Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Charlene Swan. Good evening. Welcome to the MIT Campaign for a Better World event at the PlayStation Theater in New York City. First, let me thank all of the local alumni clubs for their support of tonight's event. This includes the MIT Clubs of New York, Long Island, and New Jersey, the MIT Sloan Club of New York, and the MIT Enterprise Forum of New York City. It also includes the Black Alumni of MIT and MIT 10 Young Alumni Groups. The turnout this evening and the energy in this room is evidence of the active engagement of our local MIT community and all of our interest in learning more about the Campaign for a Better World. Tonight's topic, teaching, learning, and living at MIT, really excites me because at MIT, I studied brain and cognitive sciences precisely to learn how we learn. In my professional life as an educator, I work every day to better understand how children learn and how teachers can better reach students and guide them to be lifelong learners. I'm excited to hear from our panel tonight and to gain their insights on providing today's MIT students with the best learning experience both in and out of the classroom. MIT student life is an integral component of the learning experience. It is that MIT student life that brought me to work with Lincoln Laboratories for my Europe and investigate how we process language, that advised me through freshman year at the Liszt Visual Arts Center and lent me a Yoshitomo Nara painting to hang on my dorm room wall, that taught me how MIT students think and create and allowed us to problem solve in our three-dimensional lives. And that helped me find my community at MIT. Being a member of the Corollaries, the Institute's oldest co-ed acapella group, was an experience that has kept on giving. I found my forever home in our larger MIT community. The Corollaries, for years, have been privileged to sing at MIT celebrations, thanking a professor for invaluable service, inaugurating a new president, and sending off the graduating class at commencement. With each milestone, I have felt more connected to the Institute. This connection compelled me as an alumna to be involved in volunteer work with the MIT Alumni Association, and I've reaped benefits of growing, learning, and living in our global MIT community among our 137,000 alumni. During my decades long involvement at MIT, I've had the opportunity to get to know our visionary president, Rafael Reif, as well as the many dedicated leaders of our institute. Their aspirations for MIT and for the world make me proud as ever to be an MIT alumna and challenge me to find my part in our mission. This evening, I'm delighted to introduce one of our dedicated leaders, Marty Schmidt, MIT's provost, who will share with us how MIT is leading the charge for a better world. Good evening. Um, thank you, really, for just a wonderful New York City welcome. I actually reviewed these remarks last week before last night's baseball game, and so I wasn't sure whether it was going to be a wonderful New York City welcome, but it certainly is. It turned out terrific, and I really appreciate it. Uh, Charlene, thank you so much for the kind introduction, and certainly for your dedication and service to the MIT community, and, and for great opening remarks. Um, I also want to recognize and thank the members of MIT's William Barton Rogers Society, who are here with us tonight, for their generous support of the Institute, and for being here this evening, of course. Thank you. This is a terrific gathering of MIT friends and family. I've had a chance to interact with some of you uh, before the break. Um, and I really thank you for coming here and making tonight happen. MIT's mission, like that of any great research university, directs us to educate students and advance knowledge. But when MIT faculty pursue this mission, they launch disruptive new innovations, like the invention of additive 3D printing by our own Michael Seema and Ellie Sachs. They win global recognition, like the Nobel Prize in Physics for Rainer Weiss 
last October and the Turing Award for Sir Tim Berners-Lee in spring of 2017. And they helped to shape, support, and educate the kind of astounding students and graduates who grace this stage and fill this audience tonight. It is vital, this work we do, to educate students and advance knowledge. But MIT's mission actually demands much, much more from all of us. Its mission, our mission insists that we bring knowledge to bear on the world's greatest challenges. I believe we embrace that calling because we know that the people of MIT deliver. Because they exemplify signature MIT values, excellence, meritocracy, an appropriate balance of boldness and humility, curiosity, a passion for solving difficult problems, and a strong desire, strong desire, to use their exceptional skills to do good for our humanity. Because they are committed to innovating to solve problems so that we can make a better world. And that's why in May of 2016, we launched our campaign with exactly this inspiration, a $5 billion effort that we call MIT's Campaign for a Better World. Tonight, we will hear how MIT is building community and educating the next generation to make a better world. But for now, it's my great pleasure to invite to the stage our Chancellor, Cindy Barnhart, the Ford Professor of Engineering, who will moderate this evening's discussion about teaching, learning, and living at MIT. Thank you, Marty. Good evening, everybody. I am delighted to be with you this evening. And I want to start by pausing for a moment to express my gratitude to everyone here tonight who so generously supports scholarships and fellowships at MIT. Your generosity has a profound and lasting impact on our students, our institute, and the world. Your support gives students the chance to pursue their dreams at MIT and beyond. It also enables us to remain steadfast in our commitment to keeping an MIT education affordable and accessible to every outstanding student who has the talent, passion, and drive to be admitted to the Institute. Thank you. <laughs> Students are the lifeblood of the MIT community and they give us all hope for a brighter future and a better world. Across my time at MIT as a graduate student, then as a professor, and now as chancellor, I have had the privilege of working with so many of our wonderful students, both in and outside the classroom. The office of the chancellor consists of, consists of the office of the vice chancellor for graduate and undergraduate education, the Division of Student Life, the Title IX and Bias Response Office, and Mind, Hand, Heart. Our mission is to foster our students' academic and personal growth from orientation to commencement and every step in between. We are focused on providing the resources that students need to thrive intellectually, physically, spiritually, and personally. In recent years, we have been focused intently on creating an integrated and robust network of support for our students. We launched Mind, Hand, Heart to promote well-being and community building and encourage students to seek help when they need it. We are building the residential campus of the future. We developed a multifaceted campaign to prevent and respond to sexual misconduct on campus. And we are working to create stronger connections between academics and residential life so that we can deliver a more holistic and vibrant education to our students. Before we begin our panel discussion, 
I would like to share with you a brief video created by students that showcases one of the innovative ways the Office of the Chancellor has been engaging with students to shape their educational experience. A course created by Vice Chancellor Ian Waits last year called Designing the First Year. designing the first year. And we're trying to look at the first year, assess the needs of various stakeholders who are invested in the first year experience, and try to address those needs by providing solutions. I had a really rough freshman year, so when I heard about this class, I was really interested in making the freshman year better for other students. Coming in, it was kind of a nebulous idea, right? You know, I felt like almost anything could come out of this class. We found a lot of problems in freshman year advising in both building that relationship between the advisor and the freshman because it's a two-way street. The advisors have to reach out, but the freshmen need to be invested in that relationship as well. It's like, you know, people tell you, don't talk about religion or politics. You know, when you're at the family reunion, don't talk about the GIRs. We hope to give freshmen a greater sense of confidence when they're going off and choosing their major at the end of their freshman year. Welcome to the final presentations of Designing the First Year at MIT. The students in this class were creative and rigorous in understanding the different stakeholder needs, in developing concepts, and I am very excited for everyone here to hear about their recommendations for the first year. I'm Eric, and along with Coral, Shane, Gonzo, and Ari, we're here to present MIT Explorer to you. And I think what happened and what I was really surprised by was how much people developed an understanding of like how MIT works and like what was possible. And the final concepts I think were very realistic points that really will make MIT better for freshmen. <laughs> I mean, we're sitting at the forefront of change at one of the finest institutions in the world, and just being able to say I was a part of that, you know, just being able to say, like, I helped make that change um, at MIT, like, this is crazy. I know I came here to go to school, but little did I know I could also help the future and change, completely reform the way the students are taught in the future. right? So I am pleased to be able to share that the students' recommendations from the class informed a recently approved curricular experiment that's in, in effect now. By changing our practices around when students take GIRs, that is our general institute requirements, and by coupling those practices with changes to some of our grading policies, we hope to be able to give first year students who started this fall more flexibility to explore different majors and minors earlier in their time at MIT. Now, I'm pleased to, off to introduce our panel for this evening's discussion about teaching, learning, and living at MIT. You might recognize our first panelist from the video we just watched as he was a member of the team who helped create the Designing the First Year Experience course, as well as a lab assistant for the class. Edward Fan is a junior who serves as president of Simmons Hall and is a student lead for Externs, a semester away program for juniors and seniors. He is majoring in computer science. Next, we have John Fernandez a 1985 graduate of MIT who serves as a professor in our Department of Architecture and as director of MIT's Environmental Solutions Initiative. 
He also is our fabulous head of house for Baker House, where he and his family help teach our students in MIT's other classroom. We also have Annette Heko Hasoy, who is MIT's Associate Dean of Engineering and the Neil and Jane Popolardo Professor of Mechanical Engineering. In addition, Heko is a champion of curricular innovation. She is co-lead of NEAT, the new engineering education transformation program, and she helped create Course 2, a variant of the Course 2 mechanical engineering degree that allows students to customize the curriculum and pursue their personal interests, such as robotics, entrepreneurship, and energy. And we round out our panel with Candice Ross, who completed her Master of Science at MIT in 2018 and is currently a PhD student in our Center for Brains, Minds, and Machines. She also serves as a graduate resident tutor in Newhouse, and she is past president of the Black Graduate Student Association. Thank you all for particip participating in our discussion this evening. So as I introduced you, I offered the audience a glimpse into what connects you to our topic this evening. Now, I'd like each of you to talk about your connections in more depth. In more depth. So Edward, let's start with you. Tell us about your work with the first year experience and externs. Sure. So firstly, it's really great to be back in New York. I actually grew up in the city. Uh, I grew up in Flushing and went to school on the Upper West Side at Trinity. Um, and you know, I, that means I commuted through Times Square every morning, and I never really expected to be sitting here on stage at the PlayStation Theater at the age of 20, but here I am. Uh, I guess that's what MIT gives you. Um, so you've got a little bit of the first year, the designing the first year class from the video, but it's still a little crazy to me, even having been through the whole process of designing the class and then helping run the class, that MIT entrusted an entire design of the first year experience to a group of students with you know, relatively minimal guidance on what they should produce. You know, people were given context and background about what MIT's done in the past, and of course you know, there was the requisite design knowledge that had to be taught to people in order to have an actual process. But the ideas themselves really did come from the students. Um, you know, people drew on the experience that they had, interviews with other students and other faculty, across MIT and brought all of those things together to build ideas that really can improve the undergrad experience. One of them's already in place. The change to the general institute requirements this year uh, has been fantastic for first year students. I mean, people are reporting being just much happier overall in their first semester. And I think the long-term effects on how people will choose majors and how they'll explore what their interests are here are simply incredible. But that's not the only thing that came out of the class. You know, there are also plenty of ideas that haven't really gone into place yet, like improvements to the advising system, or even small things like how student activities are presented. And I think as those things make their way into MIT over the next few years, you'll just see the first year and then the entire undergrad experience get better and better. And I'm super, super excited about that. The other thing I work on uh, is a program called X Terms which is uh, a semester-long internship program where students work part-time and then take one or two classes at MIT. So normally at most schools, I'd imagine a, a program like this would probably be some massive administrative effort, uh, you know, years of planning, lots of faculty input, whatever. But what we did was there were two students, Drew Ben and Gabriel Genorio, who both graduated last year, uh, who had this vision you know, that MIT students should be able to basically do a Europe, but you know, as an internship instead. And so they went off and did it. They, you know, obviously talked to people to get everything set up, but then they went out and found companies that were interested, went out and found students that were interested, and the whole thing more or less works. Um, of course, you know, it'd be great to see the program grow and, you know, see it continue as a truly MIT thing in the future, but the fact that a group of students can create something that seems so large just really demonstrates the impact that students can have in to me. Thank you, so 
John, you've experienced MIT as a student and a professor. You are also head of house at Baker House. And you and your family live in the head of house department there. We often refer to our residences as the other classroom. Tell us why that is and what's most important for us to know about our residential community at MIT. Uh, well, also thrilled to be here. Um, I spent 10 years as an architect in this, in this city. Um, I'm thrilled to be with you today. Um, and are there any Baker residents? I can hardly see. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Make some noise, all right. Okay, so um, I've been at MIT now almost 20 years. Uh, my wife and I uh, became heads of house now four years ago. Um, and, and, and we're thrilled. We're having the time of our life. And um, the, the other classroom idea, I think you probably have a pretty good idea in your day. Because in my day, when I would go to class, those dreaded GIRs that we heard about, um, you know, some days, I, I have to admit, the lecture happened and I had no idea what just, what just happened. <laughs> didn't, didn't understand it. And so like, you know, the, the idea that the dorm was in a way your refuge, your way of uh, convening with your classmates, your resident mates, um, uh, to really understand the material itself. And I think that's the, kind of the, the basics. And so uh, I was at East Campus um, when I was at MIT, and uh, after class, we would almost always huddle in groups of two or three. And now as head of house, it, it comes around again. I see that this is the same kind of dynamic that happens. And it's really interesting to be the, on the other side because at Baker, um, the lounges are on every floor, we have some conference rooms, and as my wife and I walk around, especially before big exams, uh, we take a food cart around, healthy snacks, clementines and apples and that sort of thing, uh, and we, we have these little mini study breaks. We'll just pass by each table, say, you know, grab some fruit, take a break. But what, what I've noticed is that the same dynamic is happening now, but also what's happening, I think more so, is in some of the spaces with a whiteboard, with a blackboard, you see students teaching each other. And just to build on Edward's points, you know, I really do think that there is an agency about learning at MIT that is just unique. And so not only is there, the other classroom is not only about learning, the other classroom is about teaching. And I think that's one of the, the things that our, that our students do extraordinarily well. Just in terms of the houses, in terms of Baker House and all the other houses, um, what we do and what I do as a head of house and my wife and I, we manage a team of graduate resident tutors. Candace is, is a graduate resident tutor. Um, and they live on the floors and they, of course, they maintain the life of the, the floor, they ensure our student safety, they act as mentors, and they also provide that environment where self-learning and, and really uh, making yourself at home in that kind of environment, in what is still a very stressful environment. Um, that's what they do. We also um, have an area director as a, a full-time person, lives in, in a dorm, um, and a house manager, and the staff. And it's actually, I, I have to say, it's really, really poignant to see our students help out the staff, make sure to clean the lounges before they leave. And that, that kind of learning in that environment, it goes way beyond academics. So, so I think the, the notion of learning and teaching at MIT in the residential dorms is is really alive and well, and I think we'll, we'll continue to, to prosper. Thanks, John. Pecco, you've achieved tremendous success in innovating education at MIT, first with Course 2A, and now with NEAT, the new engineering education transformation program. Our audience may not be familiar with NEAT, could you tell us about the program's objectives and how it works? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, a couple of years ago, um, Ed Crawley, a colleague of mine, uh, and I were charged with thinking about what does the future of engineering education look like? Um, and in order to envision the future, the first thing we did was we looked back uh, at the past. And Ed has a, Ed's a professor in AeroAstro, and he has a fantastic example to illustrate this. Um, so he puts a picture of two airplanes, and um, the airplane on the left, 
you might recognize is a 747. Um, so this airplane has a pilot. Um, it is driven by a gas turbine engine. Um, and it's shaped like an airplane, which is dictated by, the, by aerodynamics. The plane on the right um, is the first autonomously refueled Navy drone, which went into service in 2014. So unlike the 747, uh, there's no pilot. Unlike the 747, it's driven by a fuel cell. And under, unlike the 747, um, its shape is dictated primarily by stealth, which means it's dictated by E&M instead of by aerodynamics. So you look at these two planes um, and now ask yourself, uh, which of these planes does our aeroastro curriculum prepare our students to build? And you might guess it's the Boeing 747, the plane on the left. So, um, uh, and, and by the way, this is not to pick on Aeroastro in any way, because you can find these examples in every department. Um, and the reason you can find these examples in every department is because the engineering disciplines were defined by the industries of the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, so uh, in order to address this, um, Ed and I co-founded NEAT, which is the New Engineering Education Transformation. And the cornerstone of NEAT um, is the concept of new machines. And what we mean by new machines, machines in this context is anything that engineers make. So this could be processes, it could be software, um, it could be molecules, it could be materials, could be devices, or it could be machines, like the planes that you see on the, on the screen. Um, and so the students who are in the NEAT program uh, will, uh, uh, will perform a thread of projects throughout their curricula that are based on these uh, new machines. And one of the things that we've discovered is that these machines don't fit into the traditional departmental frameworks, as you might imagine. Like, imagine building something mechanical. Everything mechanical now has a brain inside it. You can't build something mechanical that doesn't have an electronic component. Right. So the, these projects are done by interdepartmental, um, even interschool teams of students um, where they learn the skills to innovate, um, invent, and operate the machines that they're going to have to work with in 2050 rather than the machines of the 1950s. Thank you. Thank you. Candace, there are two ways you are connected with our topic. You serve as a GRT, a graduate resident tutor, and you've led a student group. Could you tell us about your work with each and what motivated you to pursue these roles while also pursuing your master's and now PhD? Definitely, and thank you for the intro. As you mentioned, I'm a graduate resident tutor and I'm with Chocolate City and Newhouse. We may have some Newhouse people here as well. Oh, <laughs> 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 And so Chocolate City, for context, is a group of 30 black and brown undergraduate men. And we're in New House, which is a lot of different cultural groups. There's Spanish House, French House, German House, or National House, so kind of all are comprised there. And Chocolate City actually began in 1975, so it's been around for quite some time. And I would say this group of men are just amazing. They're really active on campus, they have many leadership opportunities. They also reach out to different high-level admins, so I know they've met with Cindy, and she very kindly meets with them once or twice a year. And I'd say my time as a GRT has been really rewarding. You maybe even heard through John kind of the structure of the house teams. And I think the reason I really sought that out was, I think as a grad student, you can really easily get very stuck in your work and not necessarily have community. So that was one way I wanted to be more connected to campus. And then the other side for the student group, the group I led is the Black Graduate Student Association, or BGSA. And we seek to create a community that's both social and academic for black grad students on campus. And so when I first came into grad school in 2015, we had around 88 black grad students, and there are nearly 7,000 grad students on campus. So it's like, a, it's like 1%. So I think um, the aim of BJSA really is to kind of foster that for students where you might not have it elsewhere. So I think my main goal in both pursuing a GRT and uh, leading on BJSA was to find that community. Thank you, Ken. So this is a question for all of you. When we talk about the MIT community, what does that mean to you? And where did you first find community, maybe in multiple places, at MIT? Let's start with Candace and work our <laughs> way over to Edward. <laughs> so to me, I would say that MIT means everyone. That's like all identities and all backgrounds feels included on campus. I think that's really important because MIT, we know, is very rigorous. 
And I think it's really easy to experience that imposter syndrome. So it's important to feel that you do belong on campus. And so for me, the first time I experienced imposter syndrome at MIT was well, first of many times. <laughs> it was actually before I was even a student at MIT. So I did my undergrad at Howard University in DC. And I actually came to MIT for this program known as MSRP. So that stands for the MIT Summer Research Program. And this is through the Office of Graduate Education. And MSRP brings in around 40 undergrads, and none of them are from MIT. They're mostly students of color who are at institutions that don't have a lot of research funding. And you get the opportunity to come for the summer, and you are in an MIT lab, you're actually living in an MIT dorm on campus, and so you feel really integrated in the community. And I can say for me, before I came, I definitely had a perception of MIT. I was like, oh my gosh, this is gonna be a really difficult place to be in. I'm not gonna fit in, this is gonna be so scary. I'd say arriving was, it was scary, you know, the research was a bit difficult. But I'm happy to say that I was really mistaken in thinking I wouldn't fit in. I actually, gosh, I mean, it was an amazing summer. And it was really tough to leave at the end. I loved Cambridge, I loved MIT. I actually stayed in Sim, not Simmons, goodness, stayed in Simmons the next summer. The first summer I stayed in McCormick and loved it. So even when I left that summer, I knew that MIT was probably my top choice if I got in. So funny enough, my first time feeling community was before I was even a student here. And I think that is a testament to the fact that we seek to be really inclusive. Uh, yeah, so um, MIT has always felt like home to me from the first time I, I stepped on campus. So I found community in all different pockets of the, of the institute. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about um, the, the community I'm most deeply engaged with right now. Um, and as a little bit of background, um, I'm a mountain biker. And um, at some point, uh, I walked into a, a bike store um, and they asked if I'd ever ridden Highland Mountain. And I thought, oh, this is great. It's always good when you pull a tip about a local riding spot, so I was really excited. So, uh, so we, we went, my husband and I went up to Highland Mountain, and when we, when we got off the parking lot, there was a, a chairlift that you put your bike on that takes you up to the top of the mountain, <laughs> and then there were these terrifying sort of rocks and drops that you see on the way down. We thought, well, we've driven an hour and a half, so I guess we might as well try it. So, uh, so I put my bike on the, on the chairlift, went up to the top, came down, and, and I learned two very important things that day. The first thing I learned um, is that downhill mountain biking is amazing. If anybody <laughs> has not tried this, this is an amazing sport. Um, and the second thing I learned uh, is that I had entirely the wrong bike. So if you have the wrong bike, your center of mass is too far forward. So this is a mens a modest thing. You experience firsthand that your mass is too far forward. <laughs> Um, the, other, the other thing that tipped me off that my mass was too far forward is that I went over the handlebars about eight times that day. <laughs> so, check. Um, so I immediately went to buy a new bike where I, could, where I could keep my center of mass back. And these downhill bikes at the time, they were all completely different. So they had um, different linkages, they had different numbers of linkages, they had different shocks, they had completely different configurations. And I thought, okay, now I have to analyze all of these bikes to figure out which bike I'm gonna buy. Um, and fortunately at the time, I was teaching mechanics in mechanical engineering. <laughs> so I decided, you know what, I'm just gonna assign this to my class. And <laughs> in fact, I think the first problem was actually on an exam. So, uh, so, so they did this, so I had a whole semester where they just, there were just bike questions on every exam. And <laughs> at the end of the semester, I bought a bike and I realized, Wait, this is terrific. This is exactly the way to teach mechanics. My, my students knew mechanic cold by the end of this semester. Um, and so I started asking my, my colleagues and my, the faculty, I said, okay, I, like, do you have other examples in sports? Um, and uh, this opened up the floodgates. It turns out half of the, the faculty are doing these kinds of, uh, doing this kind of analysis on the weekends. Um, I, I had all these kinds of conversations like, oh, hey John, what are you working on now? And you'd be like, Oh, I'm working on medical devices. And I really like baseball statistics. You know, it, was, it was like, this is the important thing I'm working on. And then they're kind of doing this other thing under the table. And I thought, no, wait, this shouldn't be under the table. We should let all of our students apply what they're learning in their classes to these kinds of problems where they, can, uh, where they have sort of a real world experience that they can attach to it. Um, so uh, that led me to form uh, a new community, which is the MIT Sports Lab. Um, which has now been going for about uh, three years. Um, we have connections with, uh, currently we have projects with 
the Milwaukee Brewers, the San Antonio Spurs, with FC Barcelona, with Adidas, with the US Olympic Committee, with Red Bull High Performance. Um, and it's to give um, students and faculty on the MIT campus an opportunity to work with pro sports teams and brands to apply their technical knowledge um, to these kinds of sports projects. Um, and just to circle back to community, I know I'm running too long, but <laughs> to circle back to community, um, this has been the most diverse community that I've been immersed in at MIT. Um, we have students from all five schools, we have faculty from all five schools, we have DAPER involved, the coaches have been amazing, MIT Medical has been involved, the Edgerton Center has been involved, the machine shops have been involved, um, you know, and I think one of the reasons there's such good energy is that there's a there's a well-defined commonality. You know, it's very easy to start up a conversation because everybody knows they want to talk about sports, so they'll talk about sports. And second, the students who have actually been engaged in the project understand that they need expertise from all of, all across the institute. So there is a real respect for people with uh, complementary skill sets, um, which I think brings a really nice uh, feel to the group. Yeah, so uh, for me, um, two scenarios that led to a real understanding about the MIT community. Um, the first is that, so I arrived at MIT in 1982 as a transfer student. Talk about imposter syndrome. Um, <laughs> you know, so I, I arrived, uh, I got kind of a couple of my GR, GIRs, but not all of them, so I was doing my GIRs with with, with freshmen, and it was quite daunting to think, well, I'm gonna be entering, and well, is this gonna work out or not? How am I gonna be thought about? And within a day, I realized, who cares? I mean, it doesn't <laughs> really matter. And that, the seed of what community means at MIT was planted, because now, fast forward 17 years, and imagine, so it's hard to, your first day at MIT, imposter syndrome, this is gonna be really hard. Imagine um, coming to campus, being asked to interview for a faculty job, walking into the conference room where the, the interview committee is, and they're all your old professors <laughs> sitting there, every single one of them. So, so it went well. <laughs> um, but, and, and what, what struck me about my experience, especially the first few years uh, on the faculty, was that I had come up through um, design and practice. I, I practiced here in New York City. So you might know that the American Museum, the planetarium at the, at the American Museum of Natural History, that was one of the buildings that I worked on um, just before I left for, for MIT. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, but so, you know, what really then, the idea really flourished when I joined the faculty and spent a few years, that it's not where you're coming from. It's not really your background. It's really where you're going that determines your community. Um, and, and, in the, and in the third role that I now have as, as head of house, it's really interesting to me. We welcome students, first year students, and their parents, first day uh, to our building. Of course, we want to know where they're from, what their background is, um, what they're interested in, what they did in high school. But I have to admit, pretty quickly, it's more about where are you going? It's not where you've come from, what are you gonna do? And so, so the lesson for me has been that, really at MIT, it's, it's more, it's, it's less that you're finding a community, and that does happen, but it, it often happens, and it happened with me, that community finds you or you develop your own community, you, 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 you build it yourself. And I think, again, that's, that's a kind of organic structure in, at so many levels at MIT that's really unique. So, I live in Simmons, and uh, I don't know if you've seen Simmons, uh, but it's this crazy sponge-looking building. And, as a result, we don't really have floors in the typical sense that, like most storms do. And that makes governance quite a bit harder, since you, know, you can't really elect floor representatives and have them you know, go decide what the dorm wants to do. Instead, we have to resort to the, the most difficult form of government, a pure democracy. <laughs> and you know, even though nominally I'm the president of Simmons Hall, I actually still only have one vote, and I don't really have any more decision-making power than any other resident. So instead, we need to drum up interest 
and really create a place where everyone feels comfortable in having a hand in running the dorm. One of the ways in which we do this is uh, our heads of house, John and Ellen Essigman, have this wonderful cabin in Maine. Uh, and every Columbus Day weekend, uh, they let us go and use it for a weekend. So this past weekend, I led a group of about 20 Simmons residents, um, many of them fr first years. And you know, we went, and it was a fantastic experience discussing all of the issues that Simmons is facing now and talking about what Simmons wants to do going forward. And I think this transfer of knowledge and transfer of culture from year to year is just so, so important to living groups and really any community at MIT. Having this chain uh, of both just things that you know, we need to do, as well as ideas about what kind of place we want to be. Um, and finding that community and you know, nurturing that community these days at Simmons has been an incredible experience. And that's why I live there. So Pekko, now that we've talked about finding community from a personal point of view, let's focus on the primary community we think about at any university or college, the academic community. Could you talk to us about the role NEAT plays in helping students find community? Um, yeah, so, um, so, so NEAT, we ran our, our first two pilot threads were launched uh, last fall. Um, the, the, thread, the first thread was on living machines where the students were, um, are working towards a project of building a gut on a chip. Um, and the other was autonomous machines in which students are working towards developing a swarm of autonomous uh, vehicles. Um, so we let in our, our first cohort of sophomores last fall, and at the end of the year, we surveyed them. And it was a very open-ended survey. We just, we asked, okay, what were the things that, that went well? What did you like, and what should we, what should we make sure we preserve? And then the number one answer we got was a sense of community. Um, and in some sense, we got lucky, because we didn't, th this was not something that we built into the program. Um, but uh, I think one of the things um, that we, thought about in structuring this was um, that there's a there's sort of a, um, a magic number of people that work well together. Um, I think there's been a number of studies that show that somewhere around 40 or 50 um, gives you a large enough group that you feel like you're part of a community and yet it's still small enough that you know everybody. Um, and I think kind of building that structure in I think helped foster that sense of community. Um, but I also think there's something else going on that we don't understand yet. Um, and so I think this is, this is something that we really want to uh, dig into as NEAT evolves. And we want to keep getting the feedback from the students. We want to keep understanding where that's coming from and how we can grow and enhance that. Yeah, it's really interesting because we learned a similar thing in our residence halls and in the fraternity sor sororities and independent living groups. These groups of 30 to 50 seem to be ideal in, in creating community. So the, the new dorm, uh, the new undergraduate dorm on Vassar Street was designed around this concept of having um, sort of flexible 30 to 50 person uh, pods of people. Yeah. Uh, all connected by a critical pathway uh, right. through the building. Yeah. And that was, that was that design was driven very much so by students who were part of the group who were helping us to design the new Vassar dorm. So John, Candace, and Edward, why is it so important that MIT students are active in the governance of their dorms and what we call FSILGs, fraternities, sororities, and independent living groups? John, we'll start with you. Candace and then Edward. Okay, um, so um, governance in, in the dorms is, is uh, formalized and informal. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the, the formal first. So, um, you know, the governance for me, uh, both, uh, both in terms, again, as a, a student, um, alumni, and then now as head of house, the governance really has to do about the life of the of the dorm, about the life of the house. And after a long day, it's super busy, very stressful. Um, coming back to the dorm is really about coming back home 
And that has to be renewed every year, that sense of home. Um, and uh, the executive council in, in dorms, they all have them, student government. Um, it's a group of students that is, is charged with the life of the building in, in every different way, logistical and also just, you know, wh where's the building going? What kind of things um, are they doing? What are they interested in? Um, and uh, the executive council or exec uh, in Baker in the last couple of years has really um, put a lot of emphasis on this, really focused in on this, that the real role of governance is to make a home at MIT on the campus in the way that you want it to be. Um, I actually brought a prop. Sorry, Bakerites, I only have one. But this is, was produced by the Baker students just this year. So the upper students, the, the older students, they produce um, a thing, a t-shirt or whatever, every year to give to the entering first years. And this year, I was thrilled by the fact that this hat, you can't see it, but it says Baker House on the top, and then right below it says Baker Home. And I think that's really, for me, this really completely um, brings home the idea that, that it's really about uh, making a home. I'll give you one other example. A couple of years ago, uh, students came to us, a couple of students on exec, and they came to us and said, you know, in the fraternities and sororities, we have this thing called bigs and littles. Do you guys know what that is? Yeah, kind of? Okay. So the bigs, you know, the older students act as mentors to the littles and big, big brothers and big, sis big sisters to the littles. And um, our students said, you know, this is very much how, uh, a, a sense of, you know, a community because a person checks in with you and they're, can we do this at Baker? And so they um, brought it to us. We worked with them. Today, the, every first year student has a resident peer mentor. I think now eight dorms or maybe more yeah. have resident peer mentor programs at MIT. And it's, it's taken off like that. It's, it's spread across campus. It's hugely successful. I know for a fact that it's been super positive in developing life of the building, but then also in situations that are a little difficult. It's been, it's been a huge development in, in the dorm. So really, that's really my point, is students continually make home by way of governance. So I'd say speaking from the graduate student side, I think in grad school, particularly at MIT, it can be really easy to come in and sort of view it as a job. So you've already finished your undergraduate studies, you have an idea of what you want to work on for the next five to six years. Maybe you know you want to do broadly. And so you kind of come in and go home. And that's, I think, an easy place to fall into. And it's tough in research, too, because we know research has beautiful highs, but there are also many lows. And I think you need something that can be non-academic that kind of provides you purpose. And I think John used the perfect word, home. You want to have somewhere you can come to and really just feel included. And so I think that's where the FSILGs and, and those groups come into play. And so for me, my first year I actually lived in Edgerton. That's a grad dorm. And two of my roommates got really involved in the governance there. And then after that, I moved to being a GRT. And so I'd say seeing both the grad and undergrad side, I really do feel that the governance kind of gives you the sense of purpose and the ability to have leadership roles. So in Chocolate City, for instance, we actually have roles specifically designed for freshmen. So they're able to run and hold leadership roles from day one, which I think is really great. They're able to build confidence really early on. I think just broadly, whether you're an undergrad or a grad dorm, it is the opportunity for you to have this tie to campus and to have some purpose besides just your work. So, Cindy likes to bring up the term shared governance a lot, and I think that at MIT it really is not just lip service. Um, you know, students really have such a huge influential impact on almost every aspect uh, of the institute. Uh, for instance, one of the big things, and one of the things that surprised me the most when I learned about it, uh, is the fact that on all of MIT's faculty committees, which you know do all of the make all of the important little decisions that affect the undergrad experience, there's a lot of students on them. Usually, it's about you know like 30 to 40 percent students. Uh, last year, I was a member of the committee on curricula, which approves every single new class and major at MIT, and I got to experience firsthand, you know, the fact that my input as a student and as someone like generally knowledgeable about classes was incredibly valuable to faculty members who, you know, although they had a very good sense of 
like, is this class like a good class for MIT or not? They didn't have as, sense, as good of a sense for whether students would enjoy it or whether there are aspects that were very troubling to students. Um, and you know, as a full voting member, I was able to provide input and I really felt like my voice was valued. Um, in the Simmons context and in the dorm context in general, I think that the decision making process has been, you know, it's always, students are always extremely involved um, you know, Cindy meets with dorm presidents uh, twice a year, but much more if there are actual things that come up. And also with broader student governance, like the undergraduate association and dormitory council on a much more regular basis. And these meetings are points of legitimate discussion that really shape the decisions that are made at MIT. Um, and I think that's so incredibly valuable and I'm very happy that we have it. Edward and Candace, when people ask you why MIT, whether they mean why did you choose MIT or why should I choose MIT, what do you say? So I guess for me, um, it really comes down to the fact that you can basically do anything as an undergrad. Um, during my freshman year, I wrote this uh, class picking guide called Firehose. If you know any current undergrads, you should ask them about it because they'll probably know. Uh, and, you know, it's just been incredible to see like, you can just put something out there and people will pick it up and use it. Um, and the fact that you can do that, you know, as a student, as a freshman, um, is just kind of an indicator that, you know, if you have the drive, you can pretty much do anything. You know, in my freshman spring, like, I had the freedom to take Unified to two grad classes, and now this semester as a junior, I'm taking four humanities classes. Like, the thing is, an MIT education is just so dynamic. There is no static path that you're forced down on to complete some major, you know, there are the general institute requirements, but if you're clever and like, you know what you're doing, you can do all kinds of things there. And <laughs> the, the fact, it's, it's really funny to think about, but the fact that you can just map out your MIT experience in so many different ways, both academic and non-academic, is incredible. I mean, I feel like, you know, in my discipline, computer science, I've done a ton of academic stuff. But when I look back and I think about what's actually shaped my MIT experience, it boils down to all of the non-academic stuff. You know, the things, you know, leading Simmons or, you know, helping out with externs or, you know, helping the first year class run. These are experiences that, you know, I feel maybe at other places or in general, if I were ambitious enough, I could find in one form or another. But the fact that at MIT you can pursue all of them and still do whatever you'd like is, is just incredible to me. And I've absolutely enjoyed my time. I definitely agree with that. It's funny, I feel like a lot of times when you're asked, like, why did you choose MIT? People might say, like, why wouldn't you choose MIT? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I actually remember, um, so I found out, like, I got to MIT, like, gosh, like, February 2015, and I played college lacrosse. And I went to the locker room after one of my practices, and my team surprised me with a Boston cream pie, and they're like, congratulations, <laughs> like, enjoy how much, so it's kind of an assumption that like, you're, you're going, right? <laughs> um, and naturally, I chose MIT. But I think it's interesting, and I really want to echo what Edward said, where I think the bigger part of it is of course, academics are amazing, the research is amazing, but you also have a lot of non-academic things that make your experience. Because for me, I'd say my highlights have definitely been being a GRT Chocolate City, I just sincerely loved it. BJSA, I even joined the gymnastics team. I'm not a gymnast, I have no gymnastics background. <laughs> I really do feel like MIT is a place where, both at the grad and undergrad level, you have opportunities to do things that will be meaningful for you that are more than just your academics. So that's a, probably the biggest reason I chose MIT. Just music to my ears to hear <laughs> what you have to say. And I'm sure also to Pecos and John's because you know, to, to talk about MIT having multiple dynamic pathways through the education process and the role that outside of the classroom plays, it's it's what many of us spend much of our time working on. So thank you for your comments, everyone. And I would love now to turn to all of you and Hear what questions you have. I believe there will be mics coming around and maybe some lights as well. <laughs> Hi, my question is for John. 
Um, you said that you're a junior, I believe? Wait, John is the current undergraduate, right? Uh, yeah. Hi, I'm here. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Hi, my name is Kimberly Chow. Um, I was class of 2004, and I lived in Baker, course 10 and 15. Um, I'm wondering, entering your junior year now, what are you planning on doing when you get out of MIT? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess that's a good question. Um, I've, I'm pretty committed at this point to being a software engineer for a few years. Um, I'm actually going to be in a, at a firm in New York. Uh, and, you know, I think that aligns pretty well with my academic interests and generally what I've been doing. Uh, but I guess in the three to five year range, I'm actually strongly concerned going to law school, which is kind of a scary thing to announce to an audience of <laughs> several hundred people. Uh, but I think, you know, there's a lot of things there that interest me and a lot of pathways forward from there. Um, I do think that the experiences I had at MIT, I've, you know, I've done a lot of computer science things, I've explored some AeroAstro, I've explored various other uh, political science and history interests. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really hard to say where you're going to go in the future. I keep hearing this statistic that 75% of MIT grads aren't working in the field of their major after five years. Uh, and I guess to some extent that kind of embodies how I've been thinking about this. Just there's so many pathways that have opened up because uh, I was there. I was at MIT, and I'm looking forward to exploring some of them. Wendy, your class is 72. So you've talked about changing the GIR, but you've never said what big changes have been made. Uh, and as somebody who remembers extremely well what was required my freshman year and what I managed to do instead, I'm now wondering what is required and what one does. Mm -hmm. Can I offer a thought? So very, very quickly, let me offer a thought. It's not a big thing, but it's a, a little bit of a stealth thing that I've done through, we've done through the Environmental Solutions Initiative. So one of the things that I'm really excited about in education at MIT is that the continually connecting to the world in the most relevant, effective ways. And so with the ESI, the Environmental Solutions Initiative, we actually just gave all the GIR, GIR instructors a call and said, are you interested in problem sets in the environment? Climate change, acid, acidification, biodiversity collapse, deforestation, are you interested in the kind of math, chemistry, physics behind all of those issues? And every one of them wrote back and said, absolutely. You know, you're gonna produce problem sets for us? I'm interested. So, <laughs> but at the same, but, but also, they, they also, every single one of the instructors said, look, if it's related to the real world, if it's current, more and more of our students are coming to MIT having known that they've lived through climate change their whole lives. It's, and you know, the recent IPCC report, not mincing words, and, and the more we can connect the GIRs with those sorts of topics, the better learning, the better retention, the more relevance. And so this, this is a, it's not the bigger things that are happening, but it's a, a little stealth thing that we're doing. You know, the, the class that was offered designing the first year experience last semester, there were, as Edward said, a number of recommendations brought out through each of the different student groups. Um, and there's a wide range of recommendations there. Many of them are aimed around providing students more flexibility. And, you know, it, I think it, it partners well with the concepts that are driving NEAT, two-way, and many of the new degree programs that um, have taken form over the, the last few years. These are programs that cut across departments, disciplines, and schools. And students really want that because when they think about their passions and what's driving them, they're less and less likely to be defined by some departmental silo. And so at this point, um, we're working to try to move forward the, the various recommendations. The one recommendation that we were able to implement through the summer was aimed at, uh, a, again, a very strong um, goal of students, and that is give us more time in our first year to explore 
so that by the end of that year, we have a better idea of where we might want to go with our major. And the, what we did with that is we um, offered students the opportunity to take up to three GIRs any time in their MIT career in a past no record status. And what we saw uh, this semester, this past semester, was the first years in much larger numbers took fewer GIR classes and more exploration subjects. I don't know, Edward, if you want to add? Yeah, it's, it's not just a small shift. I mean, we've gone you know, from seeing, I think what this change, who this change helps the most is students who come into MIT with very little background. Because you know, in the past, they would come in and take you know, 1801, 801, all of the basic uh, core science subjects. And you know, if you're not very passionate about any of those science subjects, say you're interested in uh, I don't know, mechanical engineering or computer science, it can be kind of a difficult way to get introduced to MIT. But for the most part, freshmen were forced into uh, doing that. Um, what we've seen is that the percentage of uh, those freshmen, freshmen who come in with no background, uh, who take a non-GIR class in their first semester has gone from something like 97, 98% down to about 50%. And so that's hundreds of new students who are getting an opportunity to explore something that they're really interested in. And that not only gives them more information about what they want to do, it also just makes their first semester at MIT a better time overall. And I think that's incredibly important. Can I just add one thing about that as well? Sure. So I, um, I, I think what, one of the things about the GIRs is that they have been incredibly robust. Pro probably everybody in this room has taken the same classes their, their <laughs> freshman year, right? Which means that they have not changed for many, many decades. Um, and I, I think that one of the things that's really exciting about what's coming out of this freshman, uh, the, the class that, that um, Edward was engaged in, um, is that we are, I think we are getting used to the idea of changing them, right? I think that what's coming out of that class is the camel's nose under the tent, right? I, I think that we just, we weren't in the mindset to change the GIRs before now. Um, and I think this opens up a whole lot of opportunities. Absolutely agree. For John and Pecco, what excites you about the future of MIT? Do you want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, so what excites me about the future of MIT? So it's a little bit what I was talking about before because um, I really do think that there is an intensity about MIT's continued engagement with the world. Um, the Rogers uh, so the Barton Rogers proposal for MIT back in 1861, a few months before the Civil War, was uh, based on three principles. First is learning by doing, back then, even then, right? Second was that uh, professional and liberal arts education uh, would, would be integrated in, into the first year. And the third was that the knowledge that's imparted should be useful. Those are so current today. I, I'm just, I'm amazed at how alive and, and how relevant those, those topics are. But what, what really excites me about the future at MIT is that an academic institute living in, and again, I'm gonna talk about the climate, living in a climate changed world has a role. And we now all have a role. And it's, it's, it's really interesting to me to know how, and. And it's not just climate change. It's the huge technology changes, it's the huge economic shifts, demographic shifts. These huge planetary issues are things that we can address in our unique way. And, M and, and MIT, what excites me is MIT's never shied away from it. We have an appetite for that. How you do it, how you do it most effectively, who are your partners, that's, that's a whole, you know, a lot, of, a lot of complicated mess to figure out. But that's really what excites me is, is our relevance to nation and, and the world, service to the nation. I, I totally agree with, with everything you just said. It's service to the nation, I think, is, is one of the things that is absolutely at the top of my list. Um, I, I'll go in a, a slightly different direction as well and, and go back to my, um, my colleague, Ed, who had helped us 
create need. Um, so um, Ed and I have both been working in the education sort of area at MIT for many years, me for maybe a decade and a half, and Ed for much longer than that. Um, and, and Ed says uh, for all of his life, um, that has felt like pushing a boulder uphill. And he feels like now is the first time uh, at MIT that he feels like that we've crested the hill and that boulder is rolling down the other side. That there is so much energy and so much engagement from the faculty, from the students, from the alums, from the staff, who are all eager to push our educational mission forward. Um, and I think this is this is a hard thing to do because when you're when you're at the top, and MIT is at the top in many many ways, um, change is um, uh, change is risky, right? You don't want to you don't want to break a good thing. Um, but I feel like, for the first time, I feel like kind of the, the trepidation that usually is associated with change has been uh, replaced by uh, more of a fearlessness. And I think that fearlessness is, is permeating the Institute right now, um, and I think it's an exciting time to try some of these initiatives. So we have time for a couple more questions only. Hi, uh, Dom Ritchie, uh, class of 99. Um, so thank you all very much for coming here tonight and, and sharing with us. Um, one theme that seems to run through um, many of the stories that you were sharing is the role that student input played um, into uh, you know, the design of their community experiences, the governance of those communities. Um, and that's critical because students have that firsthand insight from their experiences to be able to identify things that might not be able to be um, uh, understood by the administration or by professors. However, students also are coming in without the broad context of the institute, dependencies, things that may not be within their immediate presence. Um, so maybe I would appreciate if you could speak to what steps uh, MIT has taken to be able to balance out being receptive to the student uh, student input um, without you know falling to one side of being either too open-ended or too paternalistic uh, in the way that it was incorporated into the uh, governance and experience design. I mean, it's, a, it's an extremely interesting and sometimes fine line that you're that you're describing here. So let me let me um, just answer one facet of this question, because I think there are lots of facets to the answer. One is that in eliciting student participation, so as I talked about governance and community, self-governance and community, life of Baker and all of that, you know, the other side to that coin is the mentoring that goes along with that from us. Uh, you know, I'm the faculty member who is there not grading them. Right, They're, I'm there to talk to them. Uh, I'm not. I'm not there to sort of evaluate them. Uh, and so the the service that I bring to that is well, yeah. I mean, with my own experience from from being part of the faculty, having deep institutional knowledge, knowing the the larger discussions that are going on that may not be accessible to students, the mentoring so that it's uh, their their interests and their activities are going in the right direction that they can be complemented and supported is is part of the role. So there's there's and that also, I mean, I could go on and on, but that also is a part of education, that, that other classroom, is mentoring students to work on big projects, to get something done, to do the, not only to make the home that they want, but to do the hard work in actually creating, actually following through. I think, I think that's a, a big part of it. I, I might just add that, um, you know, it, our philosophy uh, in the office of the chancellor is really one of, as Edward said, shared governance, where it's a partnership um, between the administration, faculty, students, staff. I think the designing the first year class experiment is a perfect example of what it is we try to do. So Edward said how it was, it was really maybe somewhat surprising even how, um, how much the students were able to drive uh, the ideas and um, what was proposed in terms of changes for the first year. But a very big part of that class was the 
the students reached out to all the stakeholders across the institute. There were um, dozens of faculty mentors and advisors who um, helped the students and provided guidance and provided them that perspective that they might not have. Uh, so I, I think it, the idea is one of mentorship, partnership, and engagement of these students with great ideas. And I have someone waving a, a sign at me, so last question. Hi, uh, Dalton McBarney, Sloan School. Uh, what's particularly impressive with all of you today is the notion that flexibility will be carried forward. When I came to MIT in the early 70s, within a few weeks, it was clear that MIT stood out specifically for flexibility. Um, the, the earliest example I had of it was there was no such field as biotech at the time anywhere. And there was a guy that I used to meet occasionally who had this dream that he wanted to fuse biology and genetics and all of that with technology. And he was a, an X major. So he had this thing in his mind. And he discovered that if you went to two institute professors and get them to sign a piece of paper, a new degree would happen. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, shit, this is, I mean, this is amazing. <laughs> so he did do that. And they turned him down because this thing had not been set up as yet. They, oh, sorry, they, they approved it, but logistically it was going to take time to happen. And he said, you know what? I lost in that. I won't benefit from it, but I did get a break from these guys. <laughs> so that's one part of it. The second part of it is um, I share also with two of you. I was a dorm tutor at East Campus. Um, yes. Plenty of stress near exam time, particularly, particularly with freshmen, because every one of them had come from being number one somewhere, and all but one of them was going to be number two or less. <laughs> so, you know, depression was the order of the day. Uh, so we had to come up with unique kinds of ways to get their minds off of not being bothered with being number two or less. Um, and, you know, I'm glad to say we succeeded. So you guys have done well. Congratulations, excellent presentation, and great to be from MIT. Thank you. Well, thank you for your interesting questions and your comments, and thank you to all the panelists for joining us tonight and sharing your wisdom with us. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, that was terrific. Um, uh, thank you, Cindy, Candice, Edward, John, and Pekka. That was terrific. Um, uh, this evening, we have showcased the extraordinary environment of MIT, where faculty and students are actively engaged in shaping the future of education, and where every aspect of the campus community is focused on ensuring that students thrive at MIT and beyond. These critical elements of teaching, learning, and living at MIT are core priorities in our bold campaign for a better world because they're focused on empowering the vision and talent of the people at MIT who lay a foundation for our work to tackle humanity's greatest challenges. And the success of this campaign, MIT's success, is making a better world and it depends upon the dedication and participation of each of you in this room. We need you to help inspire the whole family of MIT with your example by attending events like this one tonight, and like the ones offered by your local and regional alumni groups, and by supporting the MIT Campaign for a Better World with your gift. Many of you here tonight have joined in this work already, and on behalf of MIT, I thank you deeply. As of today, the MIT community has come together to raise more than $4.3 billion. 
So put that in context, that's, that is 86% of our campaign goal. It is the result of more than 96,000 individual gifts of all amounts. So just phenomenal participation. <laughs> Many of you have told us that your generosity to MIT has a simple inspiration. You know that at MIT, resources deliver results. And you've seen that a gift to MIT is truly a gift to the world. And for those of you that are tracking what I'm saying, I'm going to go off script for a second and just say that people often ask me, how long have you been at MIT? And the best answer I can give is my entire adult life. Because I came to MIT as a 21-year-old graduate student and never left. Um, and from that perspective, I can simply say that I don't think this institution has ever been stronger. And one of the things that inspires me daily is people with no affiliation to MIT approach us on a daily basis asking us to help them solve a problem that's really important to them. And I think it's no better example of how MIT can really uh, make a better world with the engagement of all these people. So what makes it true, what makes it true that um, the gift to MIT is a gift to the world, is to the people of MIT, humanity's urgent challenges are invitations to action. From our unwavering commitment to fundamental science to our zest for innovation and collaboration across disciplines, MIT is turning promising theories into practical solutions. MIT is focused on ensuring that everyone in the world can benefit from clean energy and clean water, from brilliant design and breathtaking artistic works, from nourishing food and nanotechnology, and from improved healthcare and increased access to education. We believe that the optimism, the hope, the inspiration, and the talent of the MIT community can invent a better future for the world. We truly believe that. And now we have one more fun diversion for you. Then when the lights come up, I hope you'll join me for coffee and dessert and more conversations about our beloved 